right. <laughs> All right, dude, thanks for joining us. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Well, good stuff. So, um, so you know, usually when we get into these things, um, I think it's usually most interesting if we kind of start from the beginning and kind of hear a little bit about your background and, uh, you know, where you grew up and how you got started as an entrepreneur. So, you know, why don't, we, why don't we go beginning? with that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, as far back as you want to go. Um, well, it goes a long way back. Um, I've been doing this for like more than 30 years, so probably 30, 32, 34 years, something like that. Uh, I'm originally from New Zealand, born and raised in New Zealand. Um, lived there till I was 25 years old. Uh, my father's Canadian, and then so um, in 1987, I went to live in Canada for a while. I, my father had the good foresight to get us all of us kids Canadian passports when we were, when we were young. So I was able to go to Vancouver, end up spending 15 years in Vancouver. And then um, from Vancouver, I came to Los Angeles in 2002. So I've been here for 12 or 13 years. So if you do the math, what does that equal? <laughs> 52, 51, 52, <laughs> right? So, um, so I've been doing this stuff for a long time. So when I, when I, uh, when I graduated high school in New Zealand, um, which was in 1978, um, in complete contrast to today where, you know, today almost everyone goes to college. Back then in my graduating class, like maybe 15 or 20% of the kids went to college. And, and I wasn't one of them. Um, so I, I always knew that I wanted to be in business. So I took that entrepreneurial route literally from day one since I've been 18 years old. And so from 18 till today, I've been, been building and, and running businesses. And I've done this now, I think Talisign is my ninth venture um, over the years. And, um, you know, when you do that, you learn a heck of a lot. And so, I've, you know, I, I've literally got a PhD in, in building small businesses and so I've been through it all. And sort of from everything from, you know, understanding finance and understanding technology and understanding sales and marketing and all that type of stuff. So you learn an incredible amount. I've been pretty lucky with the, with the variety of ventures that I've, that I've done. Um, I won't take you through all of them because we'll be here all night. <laughs> But I'll take you through sort of a couple of different ones that have been been sort of really thing. A couple where I learned the most um, uh, uh, in in Canada. Um, um, so we'll step back one step. There's a couple of basic business tenets that I learned really um, really early on. So my dad was an entrepreneur as well, and so he always instilled in us as, as kids that that anything is possible and you can do anything that you want to do. But he'd always say, you know, one of his famous sayings to me, which I've also adopted, is nothing happens till something gets sold. And so it's all about, you know, jumping in the deep end, but you gotta sell stuff. I meet so many people, I'm really interested in meeting the guys tonight, frankly, that, you know, some really neat ideas that are happening there. But, you know, so many people, you know, plan the perfect pr product or perfect business, but their whole life's around planning. And they don't actually get the thing off the ground and go sell something. And so it, to me, it's all about making sales happen. And you know, sales takes care of everything else that you do. And whether it's sales in an enterprise style business or, or, or sales from getting, you know, getting millions of users using your, your products or services or whatever it may be, it's about getting that traction going early and really focusing on that. And so I've really taken that stuff to heart with everything that I've, that I've done and really focused on, on how do you build a business fast. And so uh, one of the businesses that I got involved with back in uh, 1998 was, uh, was at the very, very early days of, of well, actually now it's called cloud. Back then it was called ASPs, MSPs, all this sort of stuff, managed service providers, you know, um, application service providers. And we started a business doing that in 1998. And so it was a really interesting opportunity where we were able to go out there and, and, um, and figure out how to take, um, take software problems and application problems to small businesses. And this was, this was based in Vancouver. And it was a business we started in, in 98. Um, I was lucky to have a, have a mentor or a board member at that time who was really good at raising money. And so we went out and, and raised money, but I attached myself to him because I figured that if I can learn that skill set of how to raise money, then at least I'm never gonna run out of the stuff <laughs> you know, when, I, when I need it. And so I learned an incredible amount of this guy. He was a, a P electrical PhD of all things. And, um, probably one of the quirkiest guys I've ever met in my life, but um, he had a certain style of, of raising money. So I'd sit in these rooms and watch him pitch, and some of it made my blood curl, it was so bad. 
But <laughs> what I learned out of that was what works and what doesn't work. And you know, I literally wore out pairs of shoes walking up and down some of the you know the financial districts of of Vancouver and Toronto and 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 San Francisco raising money, and got it down to it to a very fine art. And so we raised enough money with that business where it grew really fast. There was, I think, three of us at the beginning. Um, within two years, we had about 250 people. And we ended up taking it public on one of the Canadian stock exchanges, which was a really like, unbelievably interesting experience all in its own as well. How long was it from when you started it to when it went public? Um, literally 18 months. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So w it was this 98 to 2000? Is that the time we, we were went, talking? Yeah, we went public um, in March of 2000. Okay. Uh, so actually, we went public in back. We went public October of '99, uh -huh. and March of 2000 when, was when the whole world turned to shit. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, and not the, you guys might not remember this, but the, there was a there was a big bust called the you know, the well, big boom bust of the <laughs> dot com era when everything went everything you know went crazy and then it all blew up and and it was just an unbelievably great experience you know going through that process. And and you know understanding and learning from sort of the, the pitfalls that, that we that we made and a we should never have gone public, mm -hmm. you know we should have um, stayed private for a lot longer. We we're doing pretty well, but once you're in the public markets and when the public markets go south, it becomes really hard to raise money as a public company mm -hmm. when there was more money out there and available for private companies. And that's still that's still you know that, that's still true today. There's so much money out there today for private companies. It's, an, it's, it's unbelievable. But with just a great learning experience going through that whole process of taking a, uh, a company public, understanding and learning about investor relations, understanding you know, what makes a stock go up and down and how you know, if you, it's like any other part of sales, if you focus on, on getting um, interest in your stock and watching it go up because you went out there and pitched a couple of different firms and, and, t and told them a good story and then watch, them, watch the buying take place. It's just a, a fascinating experience. That has nothing to do with, the, with running the day-to-day -day <laughs> business, um, which you have to obviously make sure that you're doing that properly as well. Mm -hmm. um, in uh, end of 2001, I, um, um, I wanted to move to California. And so just as, as luck would have it, um, I'd, I'd done a partnership deal with um, Intel um, out of Utah of all places where I'd, I'd licensed some of their remote uh, management technology, and I convinced them to give it to me for free, uh, that we used in in, a, in in this business. And in that process, I'd met some really interesting people, and um, who had introduced introduced me to other people. Which other thing I'm really good at is networking and just getting out there and meeting people. And through that process, I was um, introduced to a um, a uh, couple of co-founders of this little tiny company at, um, that we it was originally called Big Fish Communications. We changed the name to Frontbridge Technologies. But they um, approached me, and I was familiar with what they were doing. They had a, some really interesting email security technology. And given what was happening with the, with the world of spam and viruses, and it was all blowing up and going crazy. And they got this, built this um, really great cloud services platform around, around doing managed email security. And they approached me and asked me if I'd consider coming down and running that company for them. And I, I was looking for a way to get down here, and so I actually um, flew down, took a look at it, really liked the, the, the technology platform, but the company was a complete mess. And you know, it had 12 people, and you figure out how can, how can a company with that, that few of people be so dysfunctional and have such a terrible culture? But it was possible, and they did it really well. And um, so I came down and looked at this company, really liked what I saw from a technology perspective. There was, a, there was a, several really good people um, in the company, and there was, there was a, f a few people that just had to go. And so um, we made an agreement, and um, you know I ended up joining the, the business and took a big piece of equity um, for joining, and then set to work. And the first thing we had to do was go raise some money because they were broke. Um, so, so there was a, they had a handful of, of um, high net worth guys that had, that had sort of funded the business, and so I took a pretty aggressive approach at the very beginning with it, which was I put together like a two-page business plan and said, "Here's here's the plan for the next 12 months," and. Um, we need uh, 1.3 million dollars to get us through the next 12 months so that we can get to the point where I can go out and get institutional funding. And so um, the aggressive, that wasn't the aggressive part. The aggressive part was if you guys don't give me the money, I'm shutting the business down and you lose all of your investment. And they were like, what? <laughs> um, but they, they paid up and they didn't give me 1.3 million, they gave me $100,000 a month to see how it would do. And I was able to take that, that money um, build a team, 
get traction, um, we went out and literally quadrupled the revenue, um, which was pretty nascent at the time, but quadrupled it really quickly and brought on some huge clients. We did things like, um, we did a huge partnering deal with Sprint back at the time. So, you know, Sprint was a, obviously you know, reasonably broad-based telco, which they had a pretty decent sized enterprise business. And we needed, we needed help to get, um, to get the service to market. And so we were able to, I guess, trick Sprint into doing a deal with us. But there was things like they had to, you know, they wanted to see our financials and our balance sheet, which was, you know, in terrible condition. And so what I, what I did to bolster the balance sheet was went to one of the, one of the investors who um, was one of our main supporters and said, I need a million dollars to put in the bank. <laughs> I need it for 30 days so I, didn't, so I wouldn't be lying to Sprint when I said I've got a million dollars in the bank. So as soon as I gave them, you know, did this, gave them the balance sheet and you know, we had a million dollars of cash, which gave them a little bit of comfort, then I gave them this money back. <laughs> so you know, it was, technically wasn't lying at all, but um, at that point in time, we had a million dollars in the bank. And so things like they wanted, you know, they wanted to make sure we could do 24 seven support. And there was you know, 12 of us in the company. And so we said, sure we can. So what we did with that was we all, we all took shifts and worked around the clock, manning that support phone in the office in case it rang. But we wanted to make sure that if it rang, there was some, someone there to go, hello. And what, what you know, were the hours on that? So somebody has to be there from, what, what's yeah, the we, night we shift just on run that? like eight hour shifts around the clock. Oh, okay. You know, and there would, people would take turns, including myself, mm -hmm. you know, sitting in the office all night long, you know, just in case the phone rang. Of mm -hmm. course, it never rang, but if you mm -hmm. didn't do it, it would have rung. Right, And right, so right. Those, those are sort of some of the things that you do to make these, these businesses happen. So we're able to get the Sprint, Sprint um, partnering agreement signed up. And then all of a sudden we had about a thousand salespeople out there selling our products. Mm -hmm. And people would say to me, you know, why are you doing with Sprint? Why not AT&T? And, you know, which is when you, and which made me crazy because that's the stupidest question ever because why did you do a deal with Sprint? Because they would actually talk to us. <laughs> you know, it's not, you know, we'd love to do a, do a deal with AT&T, but we couldn't get an audience, right? And so you get an audience with whoever you can and you make it happen. Mm -hmm. How long did that deal take? The deal took, um, it probably, in essence, took about a year. Okay. I mean, they're pretty slow. Yeah, um, well, those that's types what I. Of deals. And I think the idea, you know, when we talk about doing enterprise deals or getting that big, huge client like that, and it's such a tough thing to convince them as a small company to get on board for the reasons you've talked about. So, okay, so it a year. Maybe, it took about about ten months, but we did one thing that was really smart. It would have taken two years because mm -hmm. they're they're incredibly slow. We'd. Um, uh, Pfizer was a you know, big, big pharmaceutical company, had a huge problem with spam and viruses internally, and they wanted, a, they wanted an outsourced or managed solution. And so they put out an RFP, and we answered the RFP, and we won hmm. against a whole bunch of other competitors out there. So of course, when you do this process and you win, then they want to see your financials again. And we would never have been chosen if we had to base it upon our, our financials because they were so poor. So we took that the winning RFP deal to Sprint and said, hey, um, we've got this deal. We want to do it on your paper and your balance sheet, and, but we need to have a partnership deal in place first. And they, wanted, they had a very, very small amount of business with, with Pfizer, and they, it was one of their key sort of bounty list uh, clients that they had. And this got them completely motivated to go get our partnering deal signed up. We did the deal with, with Pfizer, wrote it on, on Sprint paper, and it was just one of those um, you know, massive um, points in time that changed the entire company. So it generated about 100000 a month in, in recurring revenue for us, mm -hmm. which put us Fantastic. on the map. That then allowed us to, so we got the Sprint deal done, that allowed us to go, I did a $5 million financing with Sierra Ventures um, out from on Sand Hill Road, and put the company on the map. Mm -hmm. And we, we did a, at the time we did a, so if you look at the funding history of that company, we did a deal at, at um, Five million, raised five million at six million dollars pre, eleven million dollars post, and I had shareholders at the time of this little company pissing and whining at me, going, we, "Why are we giving up so much money? Why are we giving up so much equity?" Mm -hmm. And it was really simple, right? People get so wrapped around the axle on, on how much they're giving up, but if you and this was raising money in the 2002 timeframe, which was oh, really horrible. difficult, yeah. horrible. It's like this or nothing, and so, you know, we went out and we raised five million at a. At, um, 11 million post, 
Then we raised another eight million at, um, at I think it was 30 million pre, and then raised another 10 million, you know, six months later. Uh, well, this, this money raising was over the course of about 18 months, raised another 10 million at about, I think it was 50 or $60 million pre. So a really nice, um, you know, escalation in value. And then we sold the company. You know, we ran, ran this business in three years, gone from literally bankrupt to, so February of 2002 to June of 2005, just over three years, we sold the company to Microsoft for 203 million wow. in a very short period of time. And all those shareholders that were whining about dilution <laughs> were so happy. You know, they made, they made, we all made a lot of money out of it. Everyone made out like bandits. And mm -hmm. so it was a really phenomenal deal. And that was sort of my first US-based deal, which, which you know, just at a personal level raised my profile and allowed me to go out and do a bunch of other things. And so, you know, from from there, um, had to had to, to spend a year at Microsoft under contract, and they were um, absolutely phenomenal. Just uh, uh, incredibly great organization to be bought by. They were so gracious in the process, and they they did everything that they said they would do. Um, just I have nothing but. Um, where and where was your office? Were you in LA? Were you in Palo Alto? Where were you? We were in Marina Del Rey. You were in Marina Del Rey. Yeah. Okay, I didn't didn't know that. Yeah, okay. in, in the marina, and now in that time in that time frame, from in that three-year time period, we'd gone from nascent revenue to um, to a dozen people when we sold the company. We had about <coughs> 175 people. <coughs> Our, our Sprint deal had worked out really well. We took that Sprint deal, we replicated it at AT&T, at IBM, at Orange Business Services in Europe. We had added 4,000 clients globally. So it was a real success story. Yeah. And um, <coughs> you know, it had gone from nascent revenue to about you know, 25 million of, of recurring and, and, and you know, an increase in revenue about 50% per year. And so it, it turned out really well. And, and Microsoft wanted us because they were a packaged software company, and we were the first cloud services platform that they'd ever had. And so we formed the basis of, of what is now Office 365. So all of our technology now is actually is part of um, Office 365. So, oh. you know, pretty proud of what we accomplished yeah. with that with that deal. Um, of the 175 people, they hired about 150, and there's probably still 80 or 90 people still working at Microsoft and doing incredibly well. Yeah. Um, so that was really fun. Yeah, 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 that sounds like that that really worked out well. Yeah. It's interesting, um, you know. So you were able to sort of salvage that company, you know, from the financial perspective, and and bring in the financing and convince someone, you know, at a very difficult time, you know, with a company that had an interesting history at that point in time to do it. And I know you mentioned earlier some tenets of fundraising that you felt like you've been able to pick up along the way. You know, what, you know, are there anything you can share from that perspective of how you approach fundraising? Yeah, I mean, I have a particular approach, and I've been, you know, I've been, I've raised over the years um, hundreds of millions of dollars in, in, in funding for various projects, and um, it's, it's really, it, you have to be a good storyteller, and you've got to be able to tell the story in, in a way that resonates with the audience, number one, but number two, really talks about what the true att attributes of the business are and where it's going. And then, and then how do you differentiate yourself against everybody else? I mean, you know, people talk about, you know, you gotta understand the competitive landscape, sure you do, but like, you know, you gotta, you gotta, you know, you gotta have a five-year business plan, no you don't. You know, you, you have to be able to get in there and tell a story that's compelling enough, that's differentiated enough, and that you can, where you can clearly define what the market opportunity is so that they can look at you with a degree of confidence and go, hey, I, I want to invest in this person and this company because I think they're going to make it. Now, the landscape for raising money is a lot different today um, than it was certainly, you know, when I started raising money in the, in the mid-90s, it's completely different. I mean, there's huge amounts of funds out there. There's just tons of, of cash available. And there's also a lot more funds that are willing to take a take a punt on on deals and opportunities that make little sense. You know, and I'll, I'll be the first one to admit, you know, when I heard of Snapchat, I thought it was the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. <laughs> you know, that shows how much I know, but you know, but it, it, didn't, it didn't make a lot of sense to me. But there's a lot of funds out there where those types of opportunities do make a lot of sense. And so, um, you know, you look at things like, like all the social networks that are out there today and, and how, how well they're doing, and all the cloud services platforms and all the free things 
that have just had massive growth with, with tons of people around that and they've figured out how to make money out of these deals. Mm -hmm. And that's exciting stuff. And you know, we well, can go out today and build a do a startup like you guys are doing in this room today and, and you know, dump it onto AWS and, and have, you know, minimal costs and you know, when we were first mm -hmm. building these businesses, you had to go out and spend tons of money on hardware and data center infrastructure and stuff like that. So it's very different today. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, do you think also now, like you know, we've we've sort of seen this idea of the liquidity events getting pushed downstream, and you talked about sort of IPOing up maybe early at the time, which I think a lot of companies did, and now we sort of have this trend where you see, you know, Uber getting a billion dollars, and you have other people coming in later. Um, you know, I mean, what's sort of your take on on how things are functioning in sort of the growth equity landscape? Yeah, so you can stay private a lot longer today and and still have liquidity. Um, you know, whether you're um, selling equity or there's there's so many equity funds out there today, private equity funds or growth funds that'll 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 do um, you know shareholder liquidity right. events that you don't necessarily have to go public. You know, I look at, you look at, you mentioned things like Uber and, um, you know, Uber doing a, a, a round of funding at 18 billion and Snapchat doing one right now where it's potentially 10 billion and, you know, Dropbox doing a $10 billion funding and or round, uh, valuation round. I mean, I think, I mean, I say, first of all, good on them. That's phenomenal. But man, they're going to have to some massive, ex massive ex exits for anyone to make money on those deals. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's, you look at, Uber and you know to for those guys to get a decent return that thing has to be worth one at, at some point in time in the future it's going to be, be worth you know five times that's going to be worth a hundred billion dollars there's just not that many companies out there that's worth more than a hundred billion mm -hmm. and and certainly not a you know not a not a, a, a software platform like that but you know the numbers they're producing are astronomic so can it will it survive will it will it um, inure to be a very successful long-term public company maybe mm -hmm. um, but I think it's like I say, it's totally different today. There's just so many more, you know, private equity transactions that play, take place where there's so much money available for private companies, and the valuations are pretty stout. Mm -hmm. You know, they're they're really solid, mm -hmm. and you have to get to that point where you know you've 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 reached scale and the business is predictable, and you can you can look at the growth of it and say, hey, the you know we're growing well. Um, you know, you get rewarded tremendously today for growth. Um, and you get rewarded even better if you can manage growth and profitability. <laughs> so, which is which is you know the interesting part. So you see a lot of these companies in Silicon Valley that are growing at 50%, 100%, 150% per year, and they're burning colossal amounts of cash. I don't like I don't come from that school. I don't understand that. So we've always tried to manage to run our businesses either at at, at minimum to be break even, but to be profitable. So we've done a, I think we've done a tremendous job of that at Telesign where we're growing at 100% per year. You know, we did almost 50 million last year in revenue. We did 25 million the year before. We're on track to double again this year, but we've done it profitably you know, right. every single year. So you mentioned we went out and raised a, a Series B round just recently. We raised $49 million. Um, we're accumulating cash at the time, so I think now we have $57 million of cash in the bank, and we keep accumulating cash on top of that. So you're not going back to anybody for the million-dollar loans right now? No, we're not. Yeah, that. We're, you know, we've got a pretty strong balance sheet and yeah. you know, uh, <laughs> absolutely debt-free and, and very predictable revenue stream and profitable. So it's all the attributes that you w we want. So people say, like, why did you raise the money? And well, the short answer is because you can, number one. The money's cheap in, 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 um, in real terms. But then it allows us to go out and do other really, really interesting things that we can take that take our business and grow it. Maybe we can grow up more than 100 percent per year. Mm -hmm. And so, looking at some really interesting acquisitions out there today, where we can um, add uh, technology to our organization to fill some of the gaps, product gaps that we have, because we're at scale. And I look at these companies out there that are doing sort of really interesting things in the security or, or identity space, and they've got you know 10 people, nascent revenue no real customer traction. So how do they go from that to, you know, to 100 million in revenue? And it's really hard. Right. And so. And especially in the enterprise space where it's, you know, you can, that can't happen overnight. It doesn't happen know, overnight. So. It's very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. And unless you've got an unbelievable sales model with super experienced people that, can, that have done it before and can deliver on this stuff in the enterprise space, it's really hard. So we can look at them and go, okay, we really like your technology. Come and join our team. 
you know, we'll give you some liquidity, come and join our team, we'll give you a piece of equity and come and do it with us. Right. And there's just tons of opportunities out there to do that type of, those types of deals. Yeah, I think that's kind of right. I, I kind of could see that sort of niche playing well for like a roll up strategy almost, because you, like you said, I think there's probably a lot of great technologists who have those little teams who, you know, like you said, can't exactly scale it or you know build up the business side of things, and you guys have that customer base, and so we have a yeah. huge customer base with great traction, and you can take these. We we know what our customers want, so you can look at these pieces of technology. Go, okay, I know I know how I can bolt it into our current product set, mm -hmm. and you know take this to market and and do extremely well with it. Yeah, yeah, no, that that that, that makes total sense. So, for you guys, is it um, you know is the plan to kind of how, how many people are in LA right now at your headquarters? So I should tell a Talisman story to, to, okay, to yeah, get to that Okay, yeah, let's see, yeah, let's hear it. Um, um, so Talisman is a great little company doing really interesting things in the in the um, uh, in the authentication or verification authentication and two-factor authentication category. And so what we do is we we're all about what, what we call mobile identity. Mobile identity um, is a is a is a concept based on the fact that we believe the only unique identifier that any one of us has that's readily verifiable, which is a key statement, is our mobile phone number. So everyone's mobile phone number, everyone in this room, whether you're whether you're you know whether you're from Russia or or, or China or whatever, India or whatever or the U.S., your that string of digits that's a, that is your mobile phone number is completely unique globally. You're the only person in the world with that unique string of digits, and you can verify it simply by picking up the phone and calling it. So things like social security numbers are, you know, they might be unique in the U.S., but they're, they're not readily verifiable. You can't, there's not a, a, an instant way of checking them. I can call myself Robert Jadon. I can pull out a driver's license that says Robert Jadon, and who's going to refute that? Uh, but it's complete nonsense, right? So how many people in this room had a fake ID under 21? I did. <laughs> like, well, you know, almost everyone, right? And and that's, but that's not identity, right? So you've got to find these, these sort of true trust anchors that you can use to build security programs and security platforms off of. So, so Talisign's all about taking that mobile number and using it as a trust anchor and then building, building um, security programs off of that. So we provide services to the biggest web properties in the world. So nine of the top 10 biggest US web properties use our services today. 19, uh, 20 of the top 25 globally, like we have all the big guys in, in Russia and China and just every big high profile name you can think of uses us for identity services. But it's all about the key things that they do is they want to attach a valid mobile phone number to every new account that they have and every existing account that they have. And they do that not because they want to spam you or use it for marketing purposes. They want to make sure that they can attach an identity to every one of these accounts because names and things like that aren't good enough. And so once that, once that, once that number's been attached, we do things like we'll, we'll verify the number and we'll, we'll produce all the attributes or return all the attributes back to our client about their phone number. So what type of number is it? Is it a landline, a mobile phone number, or a VoIP number? If it's a mobile phone number, is it prepaid or postpaid? The attributes between prepaid and postpaid are wildly different. You know, postpaid is good, and generally speaking, prepaid is, is highly risky. Who's the carrier? You know, is it AT&T or is it Cricket? You know, is it well-known or not well-known? Um, if it's a VoIP number, is it what we call fixed VoIP or non-fixed VoIP? Fixed VoIP would be something like a Vonage phone number where you pay $25 a month for it. Fraudsters don't spend money. Or is it a Google Voice number, which is totally free? We, we score Google voice numbers really badly from a reputation perspective because they're free and readily available. Mm -hmm. And so we're able to return all these attributes back. And, and so if they pass that first test, where that, like we have a lot of clients that go, if you've got a, a prepaid phone or a, um, or a free VoIP number, go away. We're just not interested in doing business with you. Come back when you have a real number because it's, it's just there's so much fraud associated with it. Um, and then once, once they accept that number, we then verify it by, by pinging the phone number through the telco layer, by either sending a, like a, a one-time pin code through either SMS or voice. We're working on some other really interesting frictionless things where we can ping the device and, and do all sorts of stuff through the telco layer as well. And so if they, they get that, that pin code and they enter it into the website or enter it into the mobile application, we can verify it that way. Once that's, once, once that's done, then that mobile number is associated with that account 
and then we can, we can do things like turn on two-factor authentication so that no one can break into your email accounts and, and steal your credentials, or if, or if they do get your credentials, which happens all the time, that at that point, your account is still safe and no one can access it because they have to have your mobile device mm -hmm. to access those accounts. So it's a really phenomenal level of security that just wasn't available you know, um, years ago. So, I mean, recently, I think um, a lot of people are probably familiar with the heart bleed that went around and sort of affected a huge swath of the internet. Um, so, I mean, obviously that was a bad thing. I assume that was a pretty good thing for you guys in Great terms of awareness yeah. and, you know, okay. I mean, that was actually when I turned on a lot of these features, you know, on my, you know, different sites. And so, um, you know, so how did that change things for you guys? You know, was it suddenly okay, you know, well, th people there's, there's so many things that happen every day, every week, every month that are, that are just really, that are negative for the consuming public, but are really positive for our business. I mean, everything from eBay, right? 150 million mm -hmm. usernames, passwords, driver's license numbers, dates of birth, all exposed on the web. The, the, the target, target hack, mm -hmm. the Adobe um, breach, Heartbleed, um, it's just it's just something. There's every, been a lot of them. Like I mean, recently, something. like it just All it was kind of time. off the charts. Yeah. You know, you read the, you know, you saw pretty, did anyone see that article this morning talking about the um, the Russian gang? You know, sorry guys, um, <laughs> <laughs> that had a, you know they they amassed a billion um, sets of credentials for a variety of people. That's actually not that difficult to do. It's freely available on the web. It's all out there. And so, you know, then you have these, all these websites that make you do a password reset process where they're, they're implementing what they call higher degrees of security by making your password more difficult. So they want, now there has to be eight to 12 digits with, a, with uppercase, lowercase um, numbers and, and, ca and special characters in it. That doesn't make it any more secure because when it's exposed on the web, it's just it's copy and paste. It, it's the same as before. And so you have to do things where you use you know, things like mobile devices as a trust anchor that can really lock these devices down. So the stuff's been phenomenal for our business. Mm -hmm. And it's been one of the big drivers in, in how we've grown you know, over the uh, last several years. Do you think that there's other methods of identification that like, you guys would be interested in? Like you know, people talk about retina or fingerprints or a variety of other different aspects, or are you guys really focused more on coupling the phone with the person? We're really focused on, um, it's a really great question, we're really focused on, on our, our view of the world today is um, how we look at this, this whole notion of mobile identity is it's a combination of three things. It's a combination of the phone number and all of its attributes, which are the things I just talked about. The device itself and all the attributes of the device, whether it's the mobile device or all the, all the connected devices within that, that particular user's ecosystem. And then it's behavior and the attributes around behavior. And so we believe that by combining all of those things, so the number, the device, and behavior, we can put together just with such high assurance that the person is who they say they are. So sort of five nines of assurance, 99.999% guarantee that that person is A, legitimate, and B, who they say they are. And in particular, when they're, when they're signing back in to everything from, you know, whether it be online banking accounts or email accounts or whatever it may be, and especially in the mobile world today, where you know, you've got all these, like the ability to access everything for your mobile device, and you have to be able to know that that person came back in on that mobile device is who you think it is. Mm -hmm. And so with very high assurance, we can do these things today. And so things like biometrics, um, I get asked about biometrics all the time. You know, hey, this voice biometric stuff's really interesting, or, or, or facial recognition technology, mm -hmm. even, you know, the the fingerprint reader on, a, on, an, on an iPhone is, is you know, somewhat interesting. It's, it's, th there's no one that's at scale though with biometrics. And the normal thing, the thing I say to them is like, just show me one company, just one out there that does biometrics that is at scale and successful. And there's no one that anyone can point to. It seems like the friction level with any of those techniques is so much more than the idea of answering a text or a phone call or, you know what I mean? It's just like so much more invasive and it, it if is. you can so get the same result with less work essentially for the user, then I don't see why you would ever go that route, but, you know. And so, the th so which segues into where we're really, where we, Talisign as an organization, are focusing our energies and attention right now is increasing the layers of, of security and reducing friction, which seems mm -hmm. sort of counter, but there's ways of doing that. And so, especially, but especially when you start taking the number of the device and behavior into a, into a seamless ecosystem of, of, of capabilities, it becomes very real. 
So some of the neat things w that we've been beta testing right now is what we call phone-only login. So in, when you go to your favorite site, whatever it may be, instead of putting in a username and password, there is no passwords. You all you to do is type in your phone number, hit log in. Your, your phone bings, up pops an app, and it says allow deny. You, when, you know, allow access or deny access. It'll tell you, hey, you know, someone's logging into your LinkedIn account from such and such a location. You know, you know that if it's you, you know it's you. You hit, you hit allow, and it instantly unlocks the account, and away you go. And so there's never a password to remember. Mm -hmm. And so once again, it, it comes back to that phone number being that sort of that key anchor in these transactions. The stuff is so slick. Everyone we show it to goes, I want it. Right. Right. It's, it's such a, a phenomenal user experience. It's sort of the goal for you guys eventually to be like, you know, the trusted medium on the internet. You know, the idea that, you know, sort of, you know, no matter which side it is, that we use your technology, that you guys are that layer. Is that sort of the grand vision for where you guys are going? Yeah, it is. I mean, whether we're the trusted medium or not, we just want to be the ones that, that, that enable um, the slickest, most secure user experience everywhere where there's a login event. Mm -hmm. And you know, and if you think about it, everywhere where there's a login event, that's a massive, massive marketplace. There's some really interesting things going on right now. There's some really, we've got some just some um, incredible conversations going on right now with the operators out there, tel telcos, mm -hmm. mobile operators in particular, and the big global operator operator platforms. These guys have so much data. I mean, they know a lot yeah. of stuff about you. <laughs> Yeah. And, and also they control the phone numbers as well. And so we're doing some really interesting partnering deals with the big um, global operating platforms where you know, taking authoritative data from the telcos themselves and then using them in this whole security vernacular is just a, I mean, just a huge marketplace. Mm -hmm. And no one's really solving these problems out there today. I mean, you know, I think everyone agrees that usernames and passwords are a joke. Mm -hmm. It's completely insecure, it's a completely broken protocol, and there's no place for it anymore. Mm -hmm. So just the ability to go out there and, and, and do really interesting um, ways of authenticating a user that is really frictionless, but very, very, very secure. Mm -hmm. So it makes total sense. Um, Okay, why don't we open it up to the audience here for a few questions. So, um, I've been sort of dominating things here. So, yeah, go ahead. Hey, um, my name's Andrew. Thanks for presenting tonight. Uh, you were talking about, you know, plugging in some smaller companies and just scaling up your platform. Um, curious, you know, everybody here who has a startup or wants to have a startup, and they're going to have the next Facebook. They don't always think, you know, I'm going to grow up to 10 people and then be acquired by you know, a bigger fish. How do you position it to someone that's leading a smaller company that they should join you and that it's worth joining part of your, your team versus trying to go on, it, on their own? It's not very hard. Um, and so, so first of all, you know, we, we, we have a good story. And so um, I'll, I'll, I'll segue back to your question um, here, here in a moment. But if you look at what's happened in TeleScience, so I joined the company October 1st of 2010. Same sort of deal, 12 people, um, much more functional um, than, than, than Frontbridge. And um, a phenomenal technology platform, it hadn't really been tested at, sc at scale, but the, the results they were getting were really good. And so we were able to come along, and the first thing I did was, was brought a team in. So I have a, a, a team of, of really high quality executives that I can bring into any, in any particular deal and brought, brought literally an entire new team in. But we've gone from that 12 people, you know, three and a half years ago to we have 220 today, and we'll have 280 by the end of the year. And, and at the same time, put in a very clear and defined sales model that took the existing technology and just grew it like crazy. And we made some really important decisions back then as to what marketplaces we we're going to go after. And because there's, there's all, there's, you know, the market's very broad. You can go after the enterprise, you can go after financial services, you can go after e commerce, you can go after all these different things. And we made a choice at the time that said, we want to go after the big cloud services platforms because that's where the volume is and that's where the scale is. And once we hit scale, we can come back and start to address all these other marketplaces. And it was with the right choice. We, it just enabled us to grow like crazy at that point in time and get us to that point of, of scale. And so when, you, when we meet these small companies that, um, I'm talking to one company right now that I really like what they're doing and they can, they can really help us in those three pillars, the number, you know, number device behavior, they can really help us in that behavioral pillar that, um, that we're a little bit weak in. 
And so met this guy that done some amazing stuff, um, got to 20 people, getting some decent customer traction. But by his own admission, he said, what I'm good at is going from zero to 20 people. I'm not, going, I'm not good at going from 20 to 200. And there's some big jumps that you have to make when you're going from that 20 to 200 process of, you know, the, everyone's sort of crossing the chasm and, and you know, many, many people make the leap to go across the chasm and they get halfway and they go, shit, I'm not going to make it. And when that happens, it's bad, right? Because you know, the fall down to earth is pretty tough. And so we can paint a picture of these guys that by doing a nice transaction with us, that's a combination of cash for today and equity for the future, that if they hitch the wagon to us, they'll make as much or more money doing it that way with, in a completely de-risked model where they're able to take some chips off the table today, and it's a pretty easy sell. You know, we talk about things like, you know, we have an 80 person sales organization that covers every major geography in the world. Then that, that 80 person sales org will be probably 180 by, by the end of 2015. It's hard to get to that type of scale. And then we talk about, hey, here's our client list. And we have the most impressive client list of anyone you're ever gonna meet. It's incredible. You say, here's our client list. We can take your technology put it into our, into our mix, and it can get, it'll be used by, these, by the biggest companies in the world that if you try to knock on the front door, they're not even gonna answer. And so it's not a particularly difficult um, sell out there. And then we'll also meet, on the flip side of that is we meet other companies, like that's that 20 person company I'm talking to who are doing reasonably well. We get a lot of other companies that just approach us and go, hey, I've got some interesting technology. I don't know what to do with it. I'm just, you know, like, I just don't know what to do next. And we'll evaluate that technology and, and sort of make some decisions around. If it, make, if it makes sense, we'll do a deal, and if not, and those are sort of, those deals are sort of five, sub $5 million deals, but that's, you know, for a guy that sort of worked on something for a year or two, or, that, or maybe a couple of years, and you walk up and you go, hey, I can pocket, you know, three to $5 million, that's not a bad ROI, you know, in those, in those situations, and so, that can also be an oftentimes that sort of stepping stone. They, they do a deal with us, they join the company, spend two to four years with us, have, have a really great time, get a lot of experience, and then it really sets them up nicely for the next opportunity as well. Now you were saying before, I think we were talking about the workforce. So is your workforce fairly distributed? I know you said you got your sales team, which is obviously all over the world, um, but is the rest of the company fairly centralized or is it? Um, so about 220, more than half of our people are actually in Europe. Okay. Um, uh -huh. We did, a, we did a really neat acquisition in uh, 2012. I bought a, um, a little company out of London that was a licensed mobile network operator. So we, in our business today, we, were, we depend on delivering our, a lot of our security services get delivered through the telco layer, meaning we send, a, we send a security event either through SMS or somewhere through the telco layer. And so sort of looking at how the economics of the business worked, um, we were we were buying services off middleman for that for that delivery component, and so we sat back and, and just said, if we don't figure out how to control our supply chain, we're going to get squeezed really badly here in a couple of years' time. So we made the decision that we needed to somehow get closer to the operators, and so we started looking at looking at how how we could become licensed as a mobile operator. I was in London on a, on a business trip and met one of our suppliers over there, small company. They were a licensed mobile operator. Mm out of the UK, have their own numbering range, which means you know, they, you know, they own a bunch of um, mobile phone numbers over there, but they had no subscribers or no spectrum. And they're using it purely for messaging, which is exactly what we wanted it for. So we, managed, we figured out, we did a deal, and we, we bought them. And they, we, th we spent, um, it was an all cash deal, um, and we spent 16 or 17 million dollars on, on, which in retrospect was a phenomenal deal for us. The company was owned by a Serbian guy, and and as part of the diligence, they, they had their sales office in London, but they had a service a service center in, in Belgrade, Serbia. Who's ever anyone been to Belgrade? Only one guy has over there. I know that. <laughs> um, no, like no one goes there. Mm -hmm. And like if you ask anybody to rank their top 500 cities of where they want to go, Belgrade <laughs> doesn't make the list, <laughs> and it's really unfortunate because it's phenomenal. I would tell anyone in this room to go there, You'll, you, it's phenomenal. But anyway, I digress. Um, so I had a 10-person service center in Belgrade, and so we went there and started meeting the people and were blown away by their um, level, of, level, level of education, their command of English, 
the, just the available technology skill sets. And so when we bought the company, we decided to make, to make that into one of our, our second sort of op center. Mm -hmm. So we now have 110 people in Belgrade. Wow. And it's amazing. Mm -hmm. We cover all of the language. We have, I think we cover 48 languages that in there from a sales perspective. We have a 24-7 operations center. We have four engineering teams sprinting. We have a BI team. We have what we call a knowledge engineering team. We have a client services group. So we have like a whole, you know, instance of our organization is based out of Belgrade. Mm. Um, that, that's been absolutely phenomenal for us. We wouldn't have been able to gotten the things done that we needed to do without the resources we can get access to there. So, yeah, very um, interesting. And I would totally do that again. And just the economics far out, outweigh or outstrip other countries mm -hmm. um, out there. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you mentioned in your early ventures you, you, you weren't able to talk to AGT and those big companies, but how were you able to talk to um, just networked our way into it. Like <laughs> you've, we found one person that knew a person that knew a person that could get us a meeting. And it's the, it's the way business is done right today. You, you know, that's, it's, it's very difficult to walk up and knock on the front door of these big organizations, especially when you're small. When you've got proof points and a story to tell, um, it's, it's a whole different situation. But we just, we just leveraged um, several relationships to get to a person that would listen to our story and actually bought into it. Does that person have to be like high up in the company? Not necessarily. That's interesting. That's a really good question. Um, you know, I, I've got a lot of contacts out there, you know, just uh, out there, right? And you'll meet one of my contacts and go, oh, I know the CEO of AT&T. Would you like an introduction? And the short answer is, yeah, just to say hi. But no, he's not going to help me. Like, they, you know, the CEO of AT&T doesn't get anything done. It's, you know, you've you got to get in at the product level and find the, the, a product manager or, or at director level people that actually has some influence and can get things done. Now, what, we, what we've done incredibly well is you figure out where the entry point is, you know, and you, you go after that, but then you, you, you map out the complete org chart of everyone that surrounds that, that you know, we call them the fox, right? You find your fox and then you map out the complete org chart of everyone that surrounds the fox. You go up, down, round and round, so that everybody around that person knows who you are. Mm -hmm. And it's just a really important part of selling, so that when the fox goes to talk to some other influencer out there about Telesign, about your company, they go, oh yeah, I've heard of Telesign, we love those guys, mm -hmm. good guys, right? Mm -hmm. And you just build this, this ecosystem of support around the fox, and it's a, we've we, we developed just some, just some incredible selling systems over the years that I think we've taken to completely new heights um, in, in Telesign itself, and it's been, a, been amazing for us. Hence the reason that we've gotten these biggest companies in the world that use our services from what, you know, we were a 12-person company just a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Go ahead. Um, so you've done the whole startup thing for a really long time, and you talked a little bit about how things are different in the financial aspect. What are some other big differences that you notice with what's happening in the startups today versus maybe 10 it's just so much easier. I mean, there's never a better time today to, to, to start a company. You know, and it's, but it's been that way for the last 30 years. Every, like... It's getting better and better. It gets better and better every single year, right? Mm -hmm. Just, you know, there was no concept of cloud services. There's, there was no AWS. You couldn't go spin up a bunch of servers, you know, for, mm -hmm. for a few dollars. Open source software. Yep, there's no, like, all the libraries available for, to software developers today, like the whole notion of open source just wasn't there, right? And it's just, it's just so much easier. And it's so much easier to test stuff. And I think that sort of comes back to you know, my earlier statement of you know, nothing happens or something gets sold. And so when you can go and test stuff so quickly and so easily. You can throw a bunch of stuff at the wall and see what sticks. And you don't have to blow $100,000 doing it. You don't have to spend $25,000 doing it. You can do it so quickly and, and get feedback and it's just it's an, it's amazing today. I think the key becomes you know what is what is that that you know that differentiator that makes it different, that makes it you know, you know geez you talk about Uber right? I mean I use Uber all the time. It's the greatest service on the planet. If someone would have you know come to you you know say hey I got this great idea on a mobile application I'm going to displace all the taxi services around the world you go yeah, good luck with that <laughs> right? But they did it right and it's just so it's amazing. These these different applications out there, and I just and I just think that there's so much. It, it, it's so early, 
um, the ability to, to displace and disrupt industries all over the world is, is just so viable today. And it wasn't before. And it's so cheap and easy to do. And there's so many more places you can go to now where once you get your idea off the ground where you can, you can get 50,000, 100,000, you can raise you know, $250,000 in, in, in incremental chunks. You know, Kickstarter, mm -hmm. that wasn't that, you know. Mm -hmm. Well shit, the internet wasn't there when I started. You know, so let alone, <laughs> let alone Kickstarter, right? It was just wasn't there. And so do you feel like it's now, because there's a lot of talk about this entrepreneurial bubble or startup bubble, and then there's also talk that it's not a, it's not a bubble, it's Russian roulette. Uh, you have a lot of people that are, it's so easy to start a company, but the amount of companies that actually make it, that cross the chasm, is very, very small. It's still pretty small. It is small. It is small. And um, so, you know, the amount of companies that, that have exits over a hundred million dollars, which in today's terms is not a particularly, you know, it's a, yes, it's a big number, but it's not a particularly big number in the grand scheme of things. There's so few companies that have exits over a hundred million dollars. It's, it's minuscule. And so there's, a, there's lots of different ways to make money in business though. I mean, I've seen a number of guys that have, that have done, had five exits, but they're all five million. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they'll do five, five million dollar exits or, a, you know, a couple of fives and a couple of tens. That's phenomenally successful. You know, if you can consistently get up to the plate and hit singles and doubles, boy, there is nothing right. wrong with that. That's, you know, you can build an amazing baseball career hitting singles and doubles. You don't have to hit, don't have to hit home runs every time up at bat. And so it's, you know, I think the key though is, is just getting out there and swing it. Mm -hmm. And it's not about like, who cares if you strike out? Go do it again. It's not, it's like the, the risk levels are so, are so low and especially, you know, when you, you guys are at the age you're at, when you know, I'm assuming you know you're not married, you don't have children, you don't have you know all this. <laughs> I don't call it baggage, but it's you know, yeah. but, you know <laughs> things yeah. you know that weigh you down, right? You got you got very little to lose, and and so going out there and swinging is like there's nothing, no greater feeling than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, depending on what category you're in, um, you know, seen some folks that have done, uh, is, is it a website or an application? Both. Both, yeah. I've seen some guys do some really interesting things with, um, you know, if they've got something that seems reasonably compelling, that they go out and they do, um, uh, like, a, uh, either run a reservation process or a limited beta where you, got, you have to apply, you know, to be included in the beta process, and they create that, that degree of buzz around it that um, is, you know, that's, that gives you sort of exposure that is really hard to get, right? And you get that right degree of buzz where people sign up and to be allowed into the beta program or into the, into the end program and seen some guys do it really, really successfully. I think like, the, the ones that, that if you go back a bunch of years who did it really successfully was Google with Gmail. I mean, when Gmail came out, you couldn't get a, you couldn't get a Gmail account. <laughs> I mean, it seems very strange today, mm -hmm. but you had to go and, and sign up and wait on yeah. a waiting list. And it created piles of buzz, right? But when you do that, if you've got something that's, that's compelling enough, um, doing those types of things can work. It's really hard, you know, unless your idea is just a out of the park home run and it's completely unique and an investor looks at it and goes, I love that. It's pretty hard to go out there and raise money without getting some, some early traction. You've got to have some metrics that you can point to and some users that you can point to and, 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 and you know, user-based metrics that make sense that you can point to and go, hey, I can scale this out. Hmm. So you, you discussed your impressive client base at LSign House now. Um, can you discuss a little your marketing strategy and your sales approach before you had acquired those clients? Um, you know, because I know, I imagine nowadays people come to you to, you know, solicit your services. Well, I wish it was that easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, because all you have to do, like you said, is just point to your list of clients and, you know, it speaks for itself. But what did you do before you had that impressive list? So, um, we are, uh, myself and my team are very good at putting together sales strategy. 
And you know, having sold, having done enterprise sales for almost 30 years, you learn a lot, right? So you learn, you learn how to run those sales cycles and, and how to you know, you know, understand who the fox is, right? Just that, that little simple thing, understanding who the key decision maker is. You see so many people go into a sales cycle and they go, oh, that guy loves us and you know, blah, blah, blah. And you ask, has he got any juice? Can he make a decision? Has he got a budget? And you go, and the sales guy goes, I don't know. Well, then you got nothing, right? And so we understand how to sell. And then, mm -hmm. and so we put together, a, with that in mind, we put together a sales process where every, every geography we go into, we put together what's called a target market framework. So we put together a list of criteria that our clients must fit into. And then we go in and we research a geography and we put together a list of companies and that becomes our target market framework. And we have, like we have 30 researchers, that's all they do is just research companies and we've got a, a list of things they have to find out about those companies, you know, right down to the point where we can estimate if they become a client, how much monthly recurring revenue, MRR, how much monthly recurring revenue are they gonna generate for us as a client? And, and then they go through and they research all of the people in the company and then they find the top five people we have to connect with. And then they go through and find out who's connected to them and how do we get to that person. And then they go through and we've got all these proprietary methodologies of figuring out how to find out what their email address is. And it's just you know, ways of connecting with these people. And then we've gone through and we've tested hundreds and hundreds of different approaches to various people to understand what gets the response. So we'll, we'll A, B, and multivariate test all kinds of, of, of email introductions right down to the font and upper caps, lower caps, you know, everything about it and how deep we go into the conversation to get something that works. And now we put all the stuff into, it's like a 150 page manual that we can get someone off the street in Belgrade that speaks Japanese and go, here's the manual, go run this in Japan. And it just works like clockwork. And so that's allowed us to go through, it's, it's a machine that we've built, a sales machine. That's really interesting because I feel like we hear about things being data driven on so many levels and I haven't heard it applied as much to the sales process the way you just did, which is I think is super interesting because it, it totally makes sense, you know, and we've heard things about email marketing and, you know, some of those aspects, but I think it's really interesting to hear about how you guys approach enterprise sales and really go from that perspective. Super you know, sales, sales unmanaged or left to its own devices is a big black hole that just sucks cash out of your bank account. And you know, there's, you, you look at, the, you meet these companies and you go, how are sales? They go, oh, it's fantastic. I got all these opportunities and you dig down into most of it's bullshit, right? And you just, you know, it's, it's at the end of the day, it's about getting stuff done, right? And, and you have to be able to measure every aspect of every part of your business. And sales is just one of those areas where you start rolling out an, an international enterprise sales organization, it is ungodly expensive. Mm -hmm. It is crazy how much it costs. And so if you can't manage those metrics and understand and know that if you bring a person on today, that at the end of month 12, they're, they're, you know, they're producing, not only producing revenue, but producing, a pro producing profitable revenue for you, and you know, we get we like just even our hiring processes are very rigorous, and very um, very well documented, and, and everything is metric. The entire business, from top to bottom, is metric. Just everything we do is is measured. Mm -hmm. Question over here. Oh. Can you give us um, our team's advice on building their team and what you learned over the years with the various different teams that you've built? Um, some things I've learned over the years is it's, it's really hard to build a team. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's where um, you pull it all with you. Like I do have a team <laughs> that follows me um, everywhere. And the reason we do that is, is um, number one, we have a lot of fun. And you know, business to me, if you, can't, if you don't have fun, that goes for, for anything in life. If it's not, if it's not fun, don't do it. You know, it's, and especially work in business, where you spend so much time there and you spend so much time with people around you, it's gotta be enjoyable and you gotta feel like you're winning. And so um, hiring is critically important. We spend a lot of time and energy on hiring. Um, you know, people that come through our, our shop, even for the most, you know, the most junior level positions will oftentimes have eight to 12 interviews. And that might sound, seem like overkill, but making a hiring mistake is super expensive. 
whether it's at a, at a junior level position and it's even more expensive at a senior position. And so we're, we, we try to be as rigorous as we can on the hiring process, but then if we make a hiring mistake, I cut really quick. Like d if you know it's wrong, don't wait. Because it's, it's the, that's the worst thing you can do is just wait and hope it gets better. Because it mm. doesn't. It just gets worse and worse and worse. And then by the time you, know, you do cut when you've waited, you're so angry, that person's angry. Everyone around you looks at you and goes, why haven't you done something? This person is not making it. They're not pulling their weight. Why are they still here? And so it's disrespectful to all the team members on the team that are doing, that are pulling their weight. And so you, you're better off not having them around. And, it, and it's, it's the best thing for them too. Mm -hmm. Another thing with that too, which I've found out to me is super important is be as gracious on the way out as you are on the way in. And I think that's really important. And you can, you can like, you know, life is long and the world is really small. And the last thing you need to do in business is burn bridges. And you know, that's one thing I think I've done really well in my career is just looked after people really well on the way out. And I, and I see young entrepreneurs in particular make some you know, horrific mistakes when they let people go. And it turns into you know, you know, really acrimonious, lawsuits start happening. Hey, look at Tinder, right? Mm -hmm. That's a fun experience. You know, when they treat it, you know, if you read by all accounts, if you read the documentation, you know, I'm sure there's stupid stuff that happened on both sides, but that, that the, the girl, I forget her name, got treated really poorly on the way out. If they just treated her well, nicely, and been respectful, they wouldn't be in the news about that stuff. And you want to keep out of the news with this stuff. So hiring, I think hiring is really important. So, you know, do things, we do a lot of personality profiling as well. Um, understanding, you know, what someone's prof you know, true personality profile is like. And you can do free things on the web that are pretty accurate. You know, we, do, we don't do the free stuff, we do the pretty more in-depth in depth stuff. We want to understand what it's, what, what it's like to get teams to work together with each other and understand, you know, if, it, it, what, what your personality style is. So if, I can, if I understand that, I can, that I can work with you better and, and position things and, and do things in a way that makes sense for your personality. Mm -hmm. is, but I, I can't stress enough just the, having the right people in the business at the right time is, is critical. And I, I've just seen it time and time again with the failures happen as we're having with the wrong people. I mean, failures happen for a lot of reasons, but having the wrong people is, is a real big reason. Yeah. How, how do you divide up your time? You know, so I know you mentioned a lot about, you know, so hiring and, you know, understanding, you know, sort of the product roadmap or the vision for the company. You know, you know, if you had to think about the buckets and how you allocate your time, you know, how would it be spent? At, at a really high level, I spend most of my time in the future. So, I, I spend a lot of my time thinking about where do we need to be in 12 and 24 months time mm -hmm. and what, are we, what do I want this business to look like in 24 months time? Then start working, putting all the pieces in place to work backwards mm -hmm. from that point. You, uh, you can't, you know, I've, and, and I have that privilege because I've got a great team that look after the today. Right. So I spend no time in the past, I spend a little bit of time in the today, and I spend most of my time in the future. And so that revolves a lot around um, um, understanding what our, our, you know, we talk about hiring a lot, but hiring still takes up a, um, a lot of my time. Like Friday, I sat through two one and a half hour presentations from product managers who were contemplating having joined the company. And they're more sort of a critical thinking exercise to see how they did. One guy did horribly and it was painful and I had to sit for the whole hour and a half and I wanted to leave after the first five <laughs> minutes. And the other guy did pretty well. But that's a, you know, that's a big chunk of a day is, yeah. you know, to spend on just on two hiring positions. But it's really, it, it's, that, it's, it's important that you have the right people. But I spend a lot of time sort of looking at our product strategy and understanding um, where do we want to be as a company. So our sort of our big lumpy things that we want to do is we want to be responsible for killing the password. That's also that we want to have a big grand vision. We want to kill the password. And so we talk about things, you know, my, my sort of, our, our, the sort of the product vision today is that whole notion of, of number, device, and behavior, right? So what can, I, what can I look at all the different things that we do that can help us fulfill that goal of making that a, a really clean end-to-end -end solution? I spend a lot of my time on the M&A stuff, looking mm -hmm. at, at, at opportunities, and, and then I spend a lot of time traveling. Okay. At, le at least half of my time, I'm out of the country. Wow. Wow. Okay. I just wanted to follow up on the question about how to build your team. I know in sales organizations, it's very complicated when you have, um, like currently I'm doing some consulting work for startups and they just sell you guys. 
it can be very difficult to decide whether or not to let someone go if they're a really great salesperson, um, but they affect the culture. And I know for a startup, it's just it's kind of like a what am I going to do? Yeah. How did you have you ever come across that example? And then how did you resolve it? I let them go. If someone affects culture negatively, gone. Even if the performance don't care. Okay. I don't care what they do. They'll they'll. You'll get a lift in performance from the rest of the organization the second that person walks out the door. Mm -hmm. I guarantee it. If, they're, if, if they have a negative influence on, influence on culture, gone. That's a, that's a, that's a kill shot for me. It's, it's, that's a, it's non-negotiable. It's the most important thing you have as a company is your culture. And if you can't maintain that and there's someone that's not additive to the culture, they need, like, they, you know, cult, the cultural neutral is useless. They need to be additive, but if they're, if they're negative to the culture, they got to go. And I see it, the scenario you're talking about is not uncommon in a sales organization. And you have to be able to corral that. You can either coach it, you can try coaching, it, coaching that person out of it or being really, uh, you, know, you know, working aggressively to try and change that. But you know in your heart of hearts that it's not going to work, right? So you're shaking your head already. It's not going to work. Yeah. Yeah. Take them fishing. <laughs> All right, I think we've got time for maybe one more question. Uh, yeah. Um, what would be your advice to some young people without a large network or without a lot of experience who want to get into like an enterprise software type of business, like starting an enterprise software? Business? To start one or, or join start one? one? You know, it's... Um, <sighs> enterprise software is hard, just by nature of the fact that you know, it's enterprises, and they 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 can be very difficult to approach if you're a you know a two, four, six, ten person shop because they that you know they're it, it's hard that way. There are some innovative firms out there though that have these innovation arms that all they do is go out there and look at what's happening you know around innovative technology, and they're they're always welcome to look at you know some younger organizations. But if I were you, if you figure out what it is that you want to do. And then boil it down to the most to, to the to the easiest starting point, because you've got to start somewhere. And what I see, I, I've seen so many people come to me with these enterprise business plans for a startup that is so complicated and so big, and it's a you know it's a boil the ocean idea, and you, it's just it's not going to happen. You know you got to but and if you back it down, if you can find you know five sort of prioritized pieces within that boil in, boil the ocean. Uh, process and get it down to a you know one part of water that you can put on the stove and put, apply some heat to it then you can get somewhere and so I think if you take that strategy just but just look for that one most compelling point in that in that whole enterprise model that you can start from and that you can spider web out from that point but if you try and build up the entire spider web on day one you're not gonna be successful it's just it's too difficult and you see it out there all the time you just like you know, look at uh, um, like Box.net, right? Mm -hmm. That that's a pretty complex business today, and they've got they've got all sorts of products in there. But they started with one simple thing, like online, like a simple online storage product that they've gone and built all kinds of other things to. You know, connectors to every service out there, and and you know all you know everything under the sun that connects to it, and they're running, you know. Like, you know, arguably successful businesses, they're burning boatloads of cash, but they're, you know, they're growing really fast. And so, but they didn't start, you know, they started with a really simple, really simple, easy to understand product that they took to enterprises and said, hey, we can solve this particular problem for you. So I think, you know, start, finding that starting point and but then being really articulate as to what problem you're solving, I think is the right place to, to, to be. Or even just domain expertise, even, I would think about. I think, you know, surrounding yourself with as many people as you possibly can um, is, is really critical. You know, one of the things I did, um, it's probably worth mentioning, when, when, I was, um, when I first moved to Canada, to North America, was um, I joined an organization called the Young, Entre Young Entrepreneurs Organization. At the time, you had to have a business that did at least a million dollars a year in, in revenue, which for some people, you know, it cancels them out. But... I built the most incredible network through that organization. I knew no one, absolutely no one, when I showed up here. And in a really short period of time, was able to leverage that organization to make, making, uh, you know, building um, relationships all over the world. 
And then you've got to nurture those relationships too. And so it's hard, you know, it's hard, it's hard to get going, but that's one way of doing it. There's sort of, and there's sort of junior organizations attached to those too that you can, that you can join where you can start networking and, and, and meet people. Um, you go to every event possible that you can, just get, get your name out there and just ask lots of questions. And then, you know, the, the best way though, if you're building a product like that, is if you think you've got a product that's a winner, get it to a certain point where you can demo it and then just start demoing it to everyone that you can. People love demos. <laughs> you know, that's, that's interesting stuff, right? It just, if it, especially if it's something really compelling. I love demoing new stuff. I get out there and do it all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, it's one of the most fun things you know, we can do. We've got a, we have an annual um, customer advisory, advisory board meeting. We do it every September in Napa. And so this year's on uh, September 25th. And it's just, you know, all the biggest name companies, representation from the biggest name companies on the planet. It's, a, it's an intimate group, it's like 50 people. But it's the Googles, Facebooks, Microsoft, Yahoo's, all these guys, all the biggest mobile operators in the world come and sit there and we get an audience in not a dissimilar situation to this where we're, we're talking about what they want to see, we're demoing product, we're getting feedback. You know, we've gotten a huge party that night, which they love. But <laughs> it's it's an amazing situation to have that sort of a network to do that. But my point about that is, you know, people love to see demos, right? They love seeing our demos, and I think if you can get out there and show people stuff, it's it's uh, there's nothing better than when you can show stuff. I see. Well, thank you so much for for your time out here tonight and for coming by Startup UCLA. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.